questions. Hi, Jeff, Sarah. <laughs> if you have questions, uh, just chat them out. We try to uh, keep everyone on mute because it, it's kind of odd if everybody's jumping in and we're not trying to exclude you. We will ask Michael any question that you would like and we've got a little bit of time. We're not in a big hurry and look, I got my notes again. So um, a little uh, housekeeping again. So today, last night, I told you guys and Tara posted on Facebook about our bison sliders, bison and baking sliders. So we did 30 of them thinking that's probably enough. And yeah, we ran out. My poor son wanted um, more at three o'clock and the poor little guy didn't get them. So I felt bad. So we're gonna, we're gonna prep up 15 orders tomorrow just to make sure that we have enough. Uh, we did 21 lunches to go, which is pretty cool. I think um, we had a, another good day of sales and, and I was telling uh, Michael earlier when some of you were on, but not everybody, um, we did a hundred, I mean, we had a guy call in um, right up as I was leaving, he wanted to give us a hundred dollar check, he's sending in the mail tomorrow. He's like, just hold on to it or whatever, cash it and then I'll come in and get a card or whatever. I just want to make sure that you guys are staying in business and, and uh, so that, I mean, we've talked about this so, so many times about the community support we're getting and hopefully lots of other small businesses in Great Falls and Montana and across the nation are doing the same thing. So. Um, let me see, anything else? Uh, oh, I know, um, we made a, a, a batch of gnocchi today, fresh um, gnocchi, and we put a puttanesca sauce and an Italian uh, sausage and then uh, fresh Parmesan cheese and fresh chopped basil. And that's what we're gonna be having with this dolcetto tonight. And Tara's gonna put up a picture right now of it because I'm just kind of proud of it. Yeah, I don't know. So anyway, that'll be our special next week. Um, I spent a long time since I made gnocchi. Man, it was, and it's so easy, but there we go. There it is, Kutnesca. All right, that's enough, Terry. You can take that off. It's not, it's not that good looking, really. All right, um, so Kathy and I got to go to this uh, really cool wine tasting in Chicago last October, early October. We were on our way to Boston for a friend of ours wedding in Kathy said, do you want to stop off in Chicago and do a champagne tasting with the Vintage 59 people, Michael? And Michael, who else was there? Uh, one of our national sales folks, Deborah Lewis, yeah. uh, came up. And, and we did it in partnership with our Chicago distributor, which was uh, Bowdoin Street Wines. So part of their crew as well helped put it all together. We went to this really cool restaurant. It was an afternoon. I don't remember what time it started, one or something. And, and we tasted, how many did we taste? Maybe 10 champagnes? Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say it might have been, it was almost a dozen, I think, that, yeah. That, yeah. that we tasted. And they were all, they were all true champagne, obviously from the region of champagne. And I've, I've been in and around a lot of wine tastings in my life. And I have never been more impressed. And Kathy and I talked about it. The professionalism of, of you two was unbelievable. The knowledge you have of, of champagne was just, mm -hmm. it was crazy. It was, um, in the, in the presentation packets and everything. So we, just so you know, we were super impressed and had so much fun and came back and we actually sold a uh, Jacquesin uh, vertical, I think what, four years? Heather, do you know how many years we had? Four, four five. Years, five years, yeah. Mm -hmm. That we had, we got the taste and we had, I think I can remember now, four or five verticals and, and we sold those almost immediately. Uh, so anyway, that's when the first time I met you, I don't know if Kathy has met you before, but that was the first time I'd met you. And we got to get you out to Great Falls once all this is done and, mm -hmm. and do maybe whatever you want to do, but maybe a trip around the world, I think is fun too, you know, like. I would love to, I would love yeah. to. I'd, I would like to not be in my house right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, it was such fun uh, um, experience. And we just want to thank you for joining us in Montana. You're based in, is it Virginia or Maryland? So I'm in Tacoma Park, Maryland. So just outside of Washington, DC. Yeah. Um, if you didn't, you know, if you didn't know you were crossing the border from the city into Maryland, um, you know, it's basically sort of the, the inner suburbs of, of Washington, DC. Nice. So kind of how we've been doing this is a Q and A and seems like it's been going well and people are having fun. So I read your biography today online and you have a pretty damn interesting story. So maybe we could just start there, just a little about your background and history and 
maybe how he ended up in the wine world and whatever you want to talk about. Uh, sure. Well, uh, thanks for including me in this. This is, this is really, I mean, we're at a time where a lot of our, you know, we're spending a lot of time sitting on our hands and wishing that we could do more. And so to be involved with people that are as proactive about all of this and, you know, to all you folks that, that ended up with a bottle of that, not a Dolcetto, um, it means the world. It's a, it's a challenging time for all of us. And so really appreciate that. Um, so for me, uh, you know, the, the road into the wine world, like I think it is for a lot of people is kind of winding and uh, a little bit accidental. Um, I was, uh, the long story uh, begins when I was a freshman in high school and I was literally on my way to my first day of classes and I was riding to school with my neighbor who was a couple years older. And uh, I remember I had the yellow class selection form that I had to fill out. And I said, Brian, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sign up for Spanish. I got to sign up for language. I should do Spanish. Right. You know, I, I hear Mr. Puente is pretty cool. Cool. You know, I'll sign up for that. And he said, no, 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 Mike, I made that mistake. Sign up for French. And I said, French, really? What, why French? And he goes, those classes are like 75% girls and you got to do dialogues and you know, it's a great way to meet people. And at 14, you know, that seemed as good a reason to do anything as anything else. Uh, and so I signed up for French um, and I ended up having an absolutely remarkable teacher all through high school. Uh, and when I was 16, she took a group of us over to France in the summertime to stay with a French family for one week and then spend one week traveling around. And uh, the, the hook was set. Um, I had a really, really cool experience. Um, stayed with the family that served wine at dinner. Um, that was not something that we did at my house. Um, I don't know if I said, but I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So, uh, you know, my, my house was more of a, more of a Budweiser household than it was a, a wine cellar household. And, uh, the experience in France was really cool. And so, uh, from that point forward, I was definitely an enthusiast. I was, I was really interested in food and wine, um, but never really considered it as something that I would be able to do professionally. Um, and so, you know, I came to Washington DC for, uh, school and uh, met my now wife uh, at school, and we decided that we wanted to, to have an excuse to go abroad. Uh, and so uh, I spent, spent one year in Paris when I was actually in college, um, got a little bit deeper into wine at that point. Um, and then we went and lived in bro abroad in Prague and lived as English teachers for a couple of years um, and, and had a teacher schedule. So we were able to travel around a little bit uh, in the summers, um, made just enough to, to be able to travel around and spend those months, you know, seeing a little bit of the world. And then when we decided to come back and sort of start our, our real lives, uh, Washington DC was our, our common spot. And so we came back here and I thought, uh, you know, I'm going to be very employable. There's no, no question. I'll find a job, no problem. Uh, and about six months later, after waiting tables at a restaurant that I used to work at in college, uh, I realized that that wasn't the case. Um, and just by happenstance, I met Roy Cloud, who was the founder of our company. Uh, he started things in 2003. This was in 2005. Um, and I signed on as sort of a jack of all trades. I didn't really even know what I was getting myself into. Um, that was in 2005. And in 2006, I was able to go on my first trip to Europe to actually visit producers. Hey, Mike. Um, Mike. Yeah. Can I interrupt? Oh, remember, yeah, go ahead. remember these questions you're just you're just completely ruining my entire script again they, the lady did that last night too what is with you right. people sorry so <laughs> that that was it i i met no, roy no, I'm joking the vintage 59 story was going to be next so i, yeah. I think kind of got into that but maybe you could tell us how roy because i think that's an interesting story too how he got started in the importing business too right Sure. So uh, Roy also sort of a circuitous route or a, uh, a, a winding route into the wine business. Um, he was a writer, um, actually had worked professionally as a freelance uh, writer for a lot of years. Um, and as he was writing, you know, the great American novel, uh, got a job at a wine shop here in Washington, D.C., a place called MacArthur Beverage, which is, uh, which is a great place. You know, sort of old school, a little bit of spit and sawdust kind of spot but their selection was incredible. You know, they just had absolutely, you know, remarkable wines. And also he suddenly realized that this was a, a way to see the world and to be involved in all kinds of different things um, and, and got hooked. Um, and it was, uh, well, he was working there 
that Jacques Schumberger, who ran a winery out in California um, in Alexander Valley, uh, decided that he was going to start a, a small import business. And he hired Roy to, to take that job, which was, which was remarkable because Roy actually didn't speak French at the time. And basically, he was, he was given a, a company expense account to go to France and find a bunch of good French wines without speaking French. Mm. And, uh, and he enlisted his brother, his, his older brother, actually, who, uh, who did speak French. And the first couple trips that he took to France were sort of surreptitiously with his brother in tow, doing translations for him. Um, and he, he, he wrote a book about it. Uh, there's actually a book uh, called To Burgundy and Back Again that he, he ended up writing and publishing about his early days traveling to France and trying to learn French and navigating all of this and, and meeting quite a few people actually um, that we now work with still today. And in fact, in some cases, we're working with the second generation. Um, I'm actually working pretty closely with some of their kids who are running those properties now. So Nice. Wow, fascinating. And your role in the company, I know you are an investor or an owner or whatever, but what kind of, I know you, you said you do everything on the website. Like it was interesting that the descriptions you gave from, you know, whatever, loading boxes to running, running people around in a car or whatever. Hostage negotiator. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, well, uh, so the company is, the company is based here in Washington, D.C. When I joined, uh, there was just two of us. It was just Roy and I. Um, he had, he had had another national salesperson who had moved along. And uh, like I said, I didn't know exactly what I was getting myself into, but it, it turned out that I kind of been preparing myself for this job for my whole life without knowing it. Um, I like to think that uh, I like to think that that six months that I spent trying to find a job was actually kind of by design because I, I found myself in a place that I wouldn't trade for the world. So um, my job, you know, these days, like any small business is um, to do whatever we need to do, you know, um, predominantly uh, my, my work keeps me mostly in an office here in DC. Uh, twice a year, I'll take trips to France to, to guide customer tours where we actually take uh, usually two cars. So a group of about eight people to travel around for maybe 10 days or so. Okay. Sign us up. Yeah, we're in. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, see, see producers and um, sometimes, sometimes visit some new folks, but mostly go to see people that we work with and try to, uh, you know, expose our customers to those people because it's the best marketing that we do. Um, they're, you know, as valuable as this is and as valuable as telling the stories of these places are, um, there is nothing like seeing the places that they're from and meeting the people behind them. Um, and so that's, that's an important piece of what I do. Um, I met Roy in 2005. In, in 2008, you know, after we had just been two people uh, sort of working, working for peanuts, um, uh, I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Uh, and so I uh, ended up being a partner in the company at that point. And um, like I say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm, I'm very comfortable knowing that I want to do this for a long time. Yeah. Cool. Crazy. Yeah. So can you tell us just before we get into the whole Italian and, and Nada and all that, maybe just kind of some, some people that you've met along the wine trail in Europe and kind of, you know, we talked about it earlier today via email is, Kathy and I got a chance to go on a, a, a importer a trip with an importer and some of the most amazing experiences we've ever had were they cook in your in their house for you and they let you taste out of their cellars and they you know just you meet their family so don't can you kind of talk a little bit about being that part of the importer world because we've been talking to a lot of American winemakers and I think you guys have a way different experience not better just different right yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I think that when, when you talk about wine in any part of the world, one of the first things you want to ask about is scale. You know, how, how big are the, the properties? Because, um, you know, there's some people that make a million cases in, in a year and make, make perfectly good wines. Um, but obviously, that's a much more, um, there's a lot more steps between, you know, fruit going into a bottle and a bottle ending up on, on a customer's table. Um, the folks that we work with are almost all family owned properties. Uh, most of them are multi-generational. Um, frequently they have just enough land, um, or just enough production, uh, to, to support sort of an immediate family. Um, you know, in certain parts of the world, Champagne, Burgundy, some of the more illustrious spots, you know, they may have sort of a family dividend that's kicking back to some other people that, that are partial owners. Um, but it's mostly a labor of love. 
You know, I think much like running a restaurant is a really challenging business, running a winery on a small scale. I mean, there's not, there's not many places in the world where small family farms exist any longer. You know, I mean, that's an endangered species all over the world, no matter what you're growing, whether, you know, whether it's fruit or grain or grapes or whatever it is. And wine is one of the places in the world, especially in Europe, where that sort of small, close-knit, um, hands-on kind of model still exists and, and still functions and actually thrives. Um, and so those are the sort of people we mostly work with. Um, and, and that means that, that much of what we do is, like you said, you know, it's very personal. Um, we don't sign contracts with people. I mean, we're, we're basically trying to um, convince people that we're trustworthy and a lot of that is done, you know, face to face. And so we have handshake agreements with most of the people that we work with. Um, and, and in that process, uh, we kind of have two criteria at Vintage 59 for the wines that we put our back label on. You know, the first is really simple. We'll taste wines, you know, that are potentially going to go into the portfolio. And if at the end of it, there's any doubt about whether it's something that fits or that we think will do well, the question is, are we going to argue about who gets to take it home? <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, really, if if we don't want to drink it, if we're not fighting to take it home at the end of a tasting, it's probably not for us. You know, we we really try to make sure that anything we put our back label on is something that we actually want to drink, um, which seems simple enough. But actually, that's not the way a lot of wine is made and sold, as you guys know. You know, a lot of wine is made and sold because it fits a particular profile or it has a, a particular commercial worth. You know, it's something that you can market and sell and it has, you know, it fits some commercial imperative, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that the people that made it really are proud of and they want to take home They're, You know, they're happy to sell it, but you know, it's, it's not the same as something that people are really, you know, want to drink. We try to work with producers, you know, like Enrico Nada, who, who are really proud of what they make and drink a lot of their own wines. We try to only represent things that we want to take home and we try to make sure that that back label that says vintage 59 actually means something, you know? Um, and then the other part of it, our sort of unofficial company motto is we don't work with fat heads. You know, there, there are a lot of really talented winemakers and, you know, like in any other business, there's a lot of people that are successful at what they do that you wouldn't really want to spend a lot of time with. Mm. And, you know, every two years, well, until this year, uh, because of the current circumstances, we'll bring a group of producers here to the United States, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 people. 20, 25 winemakers, and we'll take them to three American cities to do a, a tasting where, you know, they open their wines, we cut, you know, customers come by, we do big blowout dinners afterwards and have a good time. Um, one of the things that we're always asking ourselves also is, is this a person that you want to sit on that bus with? You know, is this a person that you want to get up early in the morning to catch a flight from Austin to, you know, uh, St. Louis uh, to, do, to do a wine show? And if, if the answer is no, then life's too short. Um, and so with, I'm, I'm not sure that answers your question, but without getting too specific, we, we try to work with people that we want to spend time with and that we really re you know, respect as people, because like I said, life, life is just too short. That perfectly answers my question. That is, well, we do the same thing. So we probably taste 25 wines a week or 20 wines a week or something from multiple distributors. And the same thing we sometimes they'll say at the end of it, you know, if you guys are going to buy some of this, you keep it. Or and we say, no, it's fine. We don't, you know, like you really, first of all, you have to love the wine and then the love the people. Right. And so I think you, we, we do the same thing in small retailers that you guys do on the, on the importing level. But tell us about vintage 59, where the name came from. Cause I like it. Cause I'm younger than that. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, Roy cloud, who's the founder of our company, um, was born in 1959 and 1959 was also a really bang up vintage almost everywhere in the world. You know, the night, you know, when people talk about wines from 1959, they're, they're usually sort of like, you know, like I, I saw God kind of moment, you know, 1959 was, was one of the great vintages in almost every place in the world. So uh, vintage 59 seemed as logical as anything else when he first kicked off. I like it. I'm, I'm a 61 baby and, in Bordeaux, that was a legendary uh, vintage. And in Bordeaux in 1982, when my daughter Tara and partner um, was born, was also another uh, legendary Bordeaux vintage, not necessarily worldwide, but yeah. So that's fun, vintage 59 was cool. 
So I know you guys recently, I, I don't know, well, I guess I don't know if it's recent or not. I know you mostly were French and then you mo moved into the Italian world, right? And how long ago is that? And do you speak Italian as well or? I, I don't, I've, I've tinkered a little bit, but um, no, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't with, that, with a straight face tell you that I speak Italian. <laughs> how about, uh, how long have you been in the Italian market and, and are you just in Piedmont or where, where, where are you at? So uh, it's, it's funny you should ask, we, we I think started, um, and again, mostly out of selfishness. Uh, we, we, wanted, we wanted to have some good Nebbiolo and some good Dolcetto and some good Barbera to drink ourselves. And so we started you know, making some outreach to a variety of different folks. And um, we had a, a, a guy who's based here in Washington, DC, who wrote for the, the Washington Post for a long time, uh, did a food and wine column, um, who's just like a Piedmont fanatic. Um, and, and he's, he's a really, really nice guy, um, who we tasted wine with fairly regularly. And at some point or another, we said, listen, you know, you're, you're in P Piedmont all the time. If you ever come across somebody that's really interesting and, and doing good stuff, we'd love to know about it because we'd love to have some, you know, Barbaresco or Barolo to drink. And it'd be, it'd be an interesting outreach. Um, and sure later that year, he went to a big tasting, um, and came back with like five or six different recommendations. Um, and we got a ton of different samples. And then Roy made a trip to uh, Piedmont, and um, that was when we first started working. And there was two producers that we began with, and uh, Nada was one of them. And I want to say that, that was, I want to say that was ten years ago now, because Enrico, uh, the guy who's the winemaker now, young winemaker at Nada that, that you guys have the bottle of, he started in 2008, and um, I think the first vintage that we bought for him from him uh, was 2009. I think that maybe his Reserva that we bought was 2008. So it was, it was sort of right when he was getting started and those wines were coming into the market. Um, since then, we have tasted a ton of wines, but much like the French portfolio, probably 95% probably of what we taste does not end up in the portfolio. Um, but we've continued to taste pretty widely and slowly but surely expanded things. Uh, we have got a producer that's in Friuli. Um, and actually right now we've got, I think, prior to the current condition of the coronavirus and all the strangeness, I think we've got another three or four producers that we just recently decided we really want to get going with. A couple of folks in Emilia Romana, um, some people higher up in the hills into the, into the Alps in the Alto Piemonte, um, and one sort of oddball down in Sicily. So we'll, we'll see, but hopes, the hopes are that, um, you know, things will go back to some sort of normalcy here and we'll be able to, to add those to the portfolio. Nice. Um, I think maybe before we get right into the, to the Dolcetto. So I've been to this, to that region before and, and tasted all of these wines. And my experience was that Dolcetto mostly in Barbera to some extent is they called it to me, the peasant grape, um, Nebbiolo is the king or the queen, I guess, of Barbaresco. But they, to me, they would come in, they'd have like, um, um, pitchers that they would have Dolcetto in and, if you just went to a tavern in the afternoon and had a snack, you know, you just get some Dolcetto in your glass. And so maybe you could talk just about the Dolcetto grape and Barbera and Nebbiolo and kind of the hierarchy of those grapes in, in the region that everybody has in their glass. Sure. Um, well, so Dolcetto in Italian means a uh, little sweet one. And that, that's not to say that these wines are actually sweet. Um, you know, they are, you know, for almost entire, almost always fermented dry. So there's not actually any leftover sugar, but in terms of the fact that it's a wine that has a really expressive fruit flavor to it, especially when it's young, you know, it's something that doesn't take a long time in the cellar or, um, a lot of aging in order to show its full potential. It's something that's juicy. And, you know, sometimes I talk about wines that have, uh, you know, like a really high deliciousness quotient, you know, like a wine that's just, it's, it's almost always easy to drink. Um, it's, uh, it's something that's really versatile as a result. Um, that's, that's what Dolcetto at its best can be. Um, I think um, for, for people that have had any exposure to Gamay in France or Gamay here in, in uh, the U.S., I, I think that they're kind of analogous in the sense that um, they're, fairly open, they're easily drinkable. Uh, they're wines that do great with a chill 
Uh, Mark, I saw in your email that you mentioned that this is a wine that is frequently served at room temperature, but does really well with the chill. That's true as well, especially as you get into summer months and you start thinking about like, you know, the last thing that you want is a heavy red wine. Dolcetto is one of those wines that is just, it's great. Um, and it's not something uh, that you need to write a book about. And, um, you know. Yeah, I, like that. I, I agree. Sometimes all of us get tired of, even in the wine business, get tired of being so serious about it. And this, it tastes like this and that. And Dolcetto is one of those ones where it's like, Simple, nice, easy drinking, food friendly wine, right? Yeah, ab absolutely, and and it's something that um, it, it's kind of a shame, um, you know, this this idea that it, that it's a peasant wine and and that it's you know doesn't have you know any any sort of like really refinement, I, I think is wrong, um, and and I know that Enrico Nada, who makes this wine, thinks that it, that it's wrong also. Um, so just a, a little bit of history on the region. Um, in, in Piemonte, back in the 1950s, um, a parcel of Dolcetto, you know, a vineyard of Dolcetto and a vineyard of Nebbiolo were valued exactly the same. Um, and there's actually uh, a, a story that was recently published in, in, a, in a big wine publication, Venice, about the fact that uh, uh, Mascarelli, one of the great producers um, in Piemonte, uh, at one point back in the 50s, their grandfather traded a parcel of Nebbiolo for a parcel of Dolcetto, even, even split. Um, to put that in perspective, today, Barbaresco and Barolo, which are sort of maybe the two celebrate, most celebrated regions in all of Italy, um, are famed for their Nebbiolo. And the really good Nebbiolos from Barbaresco and Barolo, I mean, at this point, the prices are astronomical. You know, and, and from 1950 to today, the, the sort of economic, uh, you know, well-being of the folks in that area, it was, you know, back in the 1950s, it was polycultural. It wasn't even all about wine. What was planted for wine was equal parts, you know, Dolcetto, Barbera, Nebbiolo. There was almost like one third of each. And uh, today, Dolcetto represents maybe like 5% of the plantings because Nebbiolo has become king. And because Neb Nebbiolo is commercially where you make a ton of money. Um, and so Dolcetto is disappearing. And, and most people, if they're following just the commercial imperative, they're tearing it out and replanting Nebbiolo. At Nada, uh, that parcel of Dolcetto, where, where this wine comes from, is actually right in the center of a vineyard in Barbaresco that's celebrated for uh, their Nebbiolo. And, and he actually has a single vineyard Nebbiolo that he makes from the same location but he's not tearing out the Dolcetto because he likes it so much. And he said, you know, people need to know you can't drink, you know, you can't drink Nebbiolo for every meal. Uh, you can't drink Nebbiolo when it's young. You can't, you can't find a Nebbiolo that has this same sort of like vibrancy and freshness and something you want to drink in the summertime. And so he said, and I like to drink my wines. And so I want Dolcetto. And so right there in the heart of a great Nebbiolo vineyard, he's held on to this and actually takes a lot of pride in making a wine that is, um, I think every bit as delicious as, as his Barbarescos, they're just different. You know, the Dolcetto is not going to last for 25 years. And maybe if all of the stars align, become something that changes your life. But, you know, day in and day out, those wines are something that, I mean, I wish that I was tasting a bottle of the Dolcetto with you guys right now. Um, but the, the bottles of that that I last bought are gone. They're long gone. They're, they're very easy wines to drink and they fit in a lot of different places. And so, um, yeah, that, that's yeah, that's the Dolcetto for Nada. Nebbiolos, uh, Barolos are probably what eighty bucks a bottle average, I would say. Barbarescos are probably fifty bucks a bottle, and yeah. this is twenty, I think twenty three or something, uh, whatever it is, something like that. Um, so and yeah. and climbing, I mean, that. and climbing. I mean, there's there's there is at this point, I think, a global appetite for good Barbaresco and Barolo, and the top bottles are, I mean, forget about it. Yeah, like yeah. Gaia is like probably four fifty or something, right? Yeah, I, I think five, you know you're you're looking at bottles on release that are three hundred to five hundred dollars a bottle. They're they're crazy. Isn't there a Gaia story in this Nada, in the in the in the generational Gaia story? Maybe you can tell who, people who Gaia is and then kind of that story. Yeah, so so Gaia has become one of the icons of of Piemonte. Um, one one of the most coveted sort of labels. And, and wines that at this point have taken on a, a fame that goes well beyond what's in the bottle. I mean, it, it happens to all kinds of things, but 
it's it's a producer that's surrounded by uh trophy hunters around the world you know to have a bottle of gaia is to own a trophy um and actually uh, when Giuseppe Nada's great grandfather, so Enrico's great great grandfather, I believe, first bought grapes in Triezo um, in uh, 1900. Uh, the one of the first parcels that he bought, or one of the early parcels that he bought, he bought from Gaia, um, and and actually, uh, it's it's turned out to be one of their great parcels, um, and something that probably today, if it was in a Gaia bottle. Um, would go for a whole heck of a lot more than, than we pay for it. Crazy. Yeah, that obviously happens like with, in Napa, it happened with um, Scream Eagle or, you know, he, Gaia, didn't Gaia buy property down in Tuscany, I think now too, right? He's making... It's, it's a name at this point that I think that there's bottlings in Barolo, in Barbaresco, all through the Lange. Um, I think he's, he's doing some stuff I'm in Dosti. down in Chianti too. This is the picture of the vineyard. If you guys can see it from, um, from Nada, that was on your website. Like, well, can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody understands until you go there how steep the vineyards are, right? And it's actually a very cool climate. When I was there, it was snowing. Yeah. Do you guys, you guys want to talk just a little bit about, uh, about geography here? I've got a map I could pull up real quick. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, hold on. Give me, give me just one second. Make sure this machine is functioning. Um, well, in the meantime, we've got some people that are talking. While you do that, we're going to talk about Italian pork sausage, meatballs, and cauliflower, and gnocchi, onions, garlic, and tomatoes. That's from Roger and Lisa Salmon's up in Cutbank. They are, um, they're, I know they do lentils, right, Roger? They just got approved to, uh, to sell them in, in uh, commercial applications, so that's kind of fun. Bob and Beth always make great stuff. Great red sauce with spaghetti meatballs and a comforting wine, chocolate truffles, penne pasta with Godzilla sauce, little cheese, and pizza, cauliflower, and flatbread, and pepperoni. So we're all doing uh, something in the Italian world. But. Mm -hmm. All right, Michael, do you, you got it? I think so. Yeah, there we go. Uh, are you guys seeing a map? Cookie notice. <laughs> Maybe you could say yes to the cookie notice. I don't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me see here. How about now? There we go. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I checked out the map earlier, and uh, so if you go due south from Great Falls to the same uh, latitude as Giuseppe Nada, you'll basically be straddling the Idaho border. Oh. So, I mean, like everything in, in Europe the, with the climate and whatnot, it's always surprising to me to see how far north a lot of these places are. You know, if you go to Champagne, you're somewhere up in Quebec. Um, and, and so uh, where, where Nada is here is, um, is an interesting, interesting little part of the world um, where you have uh, a, a, a really complex climate. And, and for wines, um, one of the things that grapes that are in, in places that are the best places to grow grapes all over the world is you get diurnal shifts. You have hot and you have sun during the summertime but you also have some amount of coolness, you know, at nighttime it's cold or you have wind and, and things like that to cool the grapes down. And as a result, you get a balance between sugar and acidity. And I think that with this Dolcetto, especially in 2015, I mean, you get that in spades. You've got a great like mouth filling sort of fruitiness to it. Um, I think probably with a little bit of age, although I don't have a bottle in front of me, you probably have that kind of turns into more of floral kind of aromas, maybe a little bit of violet or, almost like autumn leaf kind of, you know, smells, which are, which are really nice, but then it, it should always have freshness too. It kind of leaves you lip, lip smacking. It feels light on the palate. You want to go back for some more. Um, and, and that comes from the fact that these, you know, this is an area that is, you know, getting towards Southern Italy, but also has very steep vineyards um, and has a, has an effect of the Alps, which are nearby also. Um, you know, you get, you get winds and you get a climate that comes 
um, you know, that is to a certain extent affected by the Alps um, and, and creates cooler temperatures, particularly at night in this area. Um, and, and not as vineyards are the highest of, of all the um, vineyards in the region. Is that accurate or something? Um, his, his, you know, of the three, of the three villages that are most well known in uh, Barbaresco, which are Nieve, Trezo, and Barbaresco itself, um, Trezo is the one that has the highest vineyards, and they're they're re they're renowned for making the most uh, elegant, um, you know, delicate, lighter bodied, not, which isn't really fair, but relative to some of the other wines that can be heavier. Um, they're, they're renowned for having, you know, great freshness as a result of that elevation. Um, and nothing up there is really what we would think of as heavy, like a Syrah or a Petit Syrah or something, right? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, the, the reputation for, um, the reputation for the Nebbiolo that's grown there, which is sort of the most, you know, muscular and structured of the wines that they make, um, relative to Barolo and relative to other areas where they make Nebbiolo, Barbaresco is renowned for having a certain elegance. And, and frankly, they're my favorite Nebbiolos. I, I like Barolo a lot, but Barolo is one of those things that um, it's kind of roulette. Um, if you drink it when it's young, it can just be, it can be really massive and really tannic. Um, and if you get it at right, the right spot of aging, it's delicious. But if you go too far, then it kind of tastes like chewing on a shoe, gets a little leathery and, and kind, of, kind of strange. Whereas Barbaresco has always got this nice, um, you know, approachability and drinkability. And um, I don't know, the, every, every, every year that passes in my life, I get, I get more tired of really heavy wines. You know, yeah. um, I, I like to drink wine and, and, you know, I want to have something that's, that's drinkable. Um, we, did a, we did a vertical of a Barolo, this is probably 10 years ago, and it was from 98 through 2001. Uh -huh. So four, four vintages, and it still wasn't ready to drink. I mean, it, seriously, Barolo, more than Barbaresco, you would agree, takes up forever. Like, and it's a great wine. I love it. I sell it all the time. But it really does take forever for it to develop in the bottle and get rid of those harsh tan, tannins and, you know, kind of get some, some fruit back to it, right? Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, Nebbiolo is renowned for having a lot of tannin. Um, and especially with, you know, more traditionally styled wines, they can be... I mean, it growls when it's young. It's got it's got grip and, and tannin, and it's really kind of heavy and chewy. Um, and and Barbaresco less so. You know, the Appalachian of Barbaresco, where they also are renowned for Nebbiolo. The Nebbiolo there is a little bit softer and more approachable. But relative to this Dolcetto, I mean, this is again to come back to Enrico's logic on all this. He said, I can't drink Barbaresco all the time. You know, I Dolcetto. You need to have this Dolcetto for certain things. Um, and, and as a result, it's something that he really puts some, puts some love into when he makes it. So maybe we could talk just a little bit about Nada. Um, just, I know you've talked about Enrico, but they're what, when, when, when did they uh, purchase vineyards and kind of who, what's, what's the chain of events and the generational, um, you know, shift to winemakers and all that? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, they've been a wine growing family since 1900. So, you know, the, the entirety of the 20th century. Um, there were, like a lot of family-owned properties, there was a shift that they went from growers that were living in a polycultural region where they would sell fruit to, you know, larger producers that were doing the actual winemaking. They probably had some, you know, family production that they had for their own drinking purposes, but they weren't actually commercializing it. Um, to a family that was actually uh, making their own wines uh, beginning in, I think, the late 60s. Um, and their timing was really good because that was right at the time that Barbaresco was becoming an appellation uh, of its own, you know, actually got DOC status, um, which suddenly raised the fortunes of that area a lot. So um, wait, just one second. So DOC, we've done this. AVA in America is, a, is similar to a DOC or an AOC in France, right? Everybody kind of understands that it's a delineated area that, that grapes come from and, and it's supposed to have a specific um, soil type or whatever, right? Michael. Yeah, and, and, a, and a certain quality too, you know, in order to, in order to have your own Appalachian or DOC or AVA, um, you know, typically you have to have a, a sort of distinctive uh, and, and qualitative level in order to have that. And so if you're awarded that status, which can be an agonizing process to actually get there, 
um, if you're awarded that, it's uh, it's kind of a feather in your cap as a as a region, and and people um, typically it it also means that wines become a little bit more coveted, and usually economically a little bit more you know a little bit a little bit better for the people that are making wines there. Um, they're able to sell them at higher prices. So uh, the domain bot or the the home bottling and actually you know making finished wines that they were selling started at kind of exactly the right time for Barbaresco. Um, but nobody in that family was professionally trained. Um, they had very good holdings. Um, this Marcarini vineyard where the Dolcetto comes from is great. Um, the Cazat vineyard where they make uh, their largest production of Barbaresco. Um, and I think that's the picture that you were showing actually just a minute ago is, is a great celebrated single vineyard in, in Barbaresco. Um, they've got great holdings and uh, Enrico's grandfather and, and great grandfather. And, you know, I, I should say, actually, it's not, it, I should say Enrico's grandfather and grandmother and his mom and his dad. Um, it, it, in this family, it, it really has been, um, you know, a full family operation. It's probably not correct to say grandfather and, and father. Um, they, they ran a property that made very good wines because they had great holdings. You know, if you've got really, if you've got really great vineyards, it makes it a lot easier to make good wines. Um, but nobody was ever professionally trained. You know, they, they learned on the job. They, you know, passed down sort of the wisdom of generations from one to the next. Um, and then Enrico, as a young man, decided that he wanted to go and do enology school. And not only did he do enology school, but he traveled the world and did internships in France, um, did other internships in Italy, you know, saw a lot and, and came back with a technical awareness that nobody at this property had ever had before. And that was in 2008. Um, and in the life of a vineyard and in the life of a, of a winery, uh, 12 years is, is, a, is a blink. You know, so he's, he's really only had a small amount of time um, to make his mark on the property. And already, um, you know, if, if you read any of the critics that write about Piemonte and, and write about Barbaresco, um, he has in very short order dramatically improved the quality of the wines that they're making there. Nice. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's a young, he's, he's a really hungry guy. Um, he's got three daughters who, I mean, I don't know if you guys do social media and Instagram, he, he's got a nice little Instagram feed for Nada. Um, and you know, there's a lot of pictures, especially right now where, you know, the coronavirus thing got a little bit out of hand in, in Italy. Um, he's got some, some wonderful pictures of, you know, making wine and working in the vineyards and having his, having his daughters around. Um, they're a sweet family. I think Tara just put up the picture of the fermenting room or the barrel room. Do you see that, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Those, um, those, those, those um, vertical barrels on the left are, are called uh, troconique uh, barrels. And they're, they're sort of the creme de la creme for, for barrels that are, um, you know, large, large aging vessels that allow the wine to breathe a little bit, but don't actually mark it with new oak. You know, those are used for years and years and years. Um, all the barrels that you see there, the, the big fudra in the back, they're kind of hiding on the left. And then the, the larger barrels that are stacked on top of one another. And then the smaller burgundy barrels up against the brick wall. That's all for the Nebbiolo and his Barbera Superiore or his Longe Nebbiolo. Um, those are all used for, for the varietals that have a little bit more structure and tannin. Um, the Dolcetto, um, I actually told him that I was going to do this and I said, you know, if you had just a couple things to say about Dolcetto, you know, what would you say? And he said, um, Dolcetto doesn't need wood. And in fact, it hates wood. You know, if you're, if you're using wood on your Dolcetto, then, um, you're making a mistake because, you know, it takes away from the, the vibrancy and sort of the primary fruit and the great flavors that it has. Um, and then the other thing he said is that it's something that is prone to reduction, which is to say that if it doesn't get enough oxygen in the winemaking process, it starts to take on some kind of funky aromas. It can get to be a little bit um, eggy, you know, smell kind of sulfur type aromas or like matchsticks. And, and more than anything, it just loses its, its fruit. It stops, it stops tasting really fruity. And so in the winemaking process, he does everything in tank and does pretty regular rackings. That is to say that the wine is taken out of the tank and usually pumped over the top use oxygen in the process and make sure that that primary fruit is expressed. 
So I'm going to get geeky for a second and get yelled at by my wife and my daughter. But do you know about the kind of the new generation and the old generation in Barolo and Barbaresco and Piemonte in general with um, the use of small barriques compared to the, to the traditional method that's been done? And, and maybe a little quick explanation of that, if you know about it. Sure. So there's, um, I mean, yeah. If you think about, you know, that, you'll go back to the 1950s in Barbaresco or Barolo, where most family farms had grapes. And if they had grapes, they were probably equal parts of Dolcetto and Barbera and Nebbiolo, because all of those wines brought something different. But there wasn't this global economy of wine like there is now. You know, they, they were making those wines for their, because they were utilitarian, because they had some value to them. Um, they probably also may have been doing something with livestock or cereals or, you know, fruit trees or almond trees. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of uh, olives in that area. You know, most of these people were running polycultural farms in any way that they could to sort of support themselves and maybe have something extra to sell, um, but mostly to support themselves. In that time, all they had was wood barrels. And typically, um, the barrels that were the most long-lived and also the most uh, efficient were larger oak barrels. So either the long, you know, tall vertical ones, but more often than not, you know, big fudra and barrels that were probably five, six, seven, eight feet tall um, that you could use for 75 years if you took care of them. Um, that was the most economical thing to do. Uh, as Nebbiolo and as these parts of the world, and this is a story incidentally that has been repeated in all kinds of different regions around the world. As that area started to be economically more viable to do um, you know, sort of fancy wines, then people had the resources to buy new oak barrels every single year to age the wines in. And the effect on that was that when you age things in smaller oak barrels, it allows the wine to have more of a conversation with oxygen as it's aging in the cellar. And so usually a little bit more approachable when it's young, a little bit drinker, a little bit uh, e easier drinking, a little bit fruitier. And also if they're new barrels, a kind of toasty rich flavor which back in the day when it was rare was was coveted and and also back in the day when people aged wines you know regularly for 20 or 30 years that oak usually would become integrated in the wines and it was coveted and so the pendulum started to swing and barbaresco and barolo more and more producers started aging the wines in in smaller burgundy barrels and more new oak uh, that also has a, a very new world connotation you know, the wine started to be made more like a lot of California Cabernets were. Um, and the old traditionalists and the new fandangled folks that were using smaller oak, um, I mean, it was War of the Roses. You know, people like, let's go down to the village square and fight about it. Um, and there actually are. There's, there's a lot of stories. That, that did happen, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's lots of stories where people were you know, cousins no longer speaking to each other because, you know, Giuseppe started using small barrels and um, it was really controversial. A lot of people thought that they were giving up something that was really a fundamental part of their culture and their identity and the kind of wines that they made. Um, and that pendulum has swung back, you know, much like it has in California also. Um, just because you can afford new oak barrels doesn't necessarily mean that that makes the best wines. And I think that Enrico is a perfect uh, poster child for kind of the new generation there that is looking less to his parents than he is to his grandparents or his great grandparents for guidance. You know, if you want to make the most long lived, if you want to make the most distinctive and, and wines that could not come from anywhere else in the world, maybe we should look back to the way our grandparents were doing things rather than the way our parents were. Um, That's another interesting point because I have tasted a lot of Nebbiolos from the new world Dolcettos, Barberas, and I don't feel like anybody is doing anything like Piemonte does. And I don't think, it's, it's kind of like the truffles of that region. You know, it's, it's hard to recreate either the wine or the food of that, of that area in the New World or in, in anywhere outside of that little tiny microcosm of, 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 of food and wine, right? Yeah, and, and that's another thing too. I mean, the, the deep history on Dolcetto is that um, Virtually everyone's certain that it's a, a native variety to that, that region in Italy. Um, and, and Dolcetto has, you know, a, a storied history and, and people are certain a history that's at least a century long there. 
Um, and there's very few places, you know, the plantations of Dolcetto outside of Italy are very few. And, and in fact, even outside of that Alba region um, and Asti region in, in Northern Italy, there's not many. I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a distinctive thing that they do better than anybody else in the entire world. Yeah, I agree. So maybe the last question I have, if you guys have more, let me know, but um, have, have you been to Alba, I assume? I, uh, it's kind of a sore topic. Well, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> anyway, it's, to me, it's a beautiful, beautiful region. And it's also the food capital of Piemonte. It, that's where truffles come from. I mean, all these things that uh, it's more of a meat sauce kind of like everybody kind of makes fun of in our local town. We have a thing called Boris, which is an old fashioned steak house. And they make fun of the brown gravy sauce that they do because that's not authentic Italian and it's not true. It's a meat sauce from Northern Italy, which is where this is. And it's, it's more Germanic, maybe more Austrian um, in, in its flavors and food. And I think these wines are perfect pairings for those, for those foods too. But anyway, it's a beautiful place to visit. So I know uh, obviously we've been asking everybody when to visit all these like Oregon or, or you know, Paso Robles or whatever. But to me, I think early spring in, in Piemonte is like being in Montana. Beautiful mountains, um, fun food are just coming on on um, the scene. And, and so I, that, I was gonna ask you about the, you know, kind of the food scene and, the, and what you think you might pair with this if you were gonna cook or order. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that. I, I, had, a, I had a trip scheduled um, to, to go and see some of these producers and take a couple of folks. Uh, and about a week before I was supposed to leave, I tore my Achilles tendon playing basketball. <laughs> You're too old for that, man. And, and uh, I, that was my NBA career is officially over. I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> Those chances are gone. Uh, and, and that trip to Piemonte didn't work. So it's, it's on the short list though. Um, the, um, you know, the, the foods that are there and actually there's a, there's a food myth, I think, that, that runs around Italy that's very pop popular, particularly in that area, which is that in the 1500s, when Cath Catherine de' Medici um, went to France uh, uh, with King Henry II, um, that she took with her the Italian food culture and many of the ingredients that seeded what became French cuisine. And so the, the, the narrative in Italy is that French food would never have become French food without Italians, of course. Right. Um, it's like the Greeks claim the same thing about Italian. Yeah. yeah. Um, which, is, which is probably a, a food myth. What, what I would say is that um, a lot of the foods that Enrico talks about and a lot of the foods that are popular in this part of the world, they seem to have as much in common with regions in, in southern France across the Alps as they do with southern Italy, you know, maybe much more so. And, and I think that's true with the wines too. I mean, I think that this, these wines fit into the profile of somebody who knows Beaujolais or somebody who knows Burgundy or somebody who knows, you know, the Northern Rhone, you know, these, these things all sort of fit together in the same uh, perspective. Whereas I think suddenly you get south of Florence and it's like you've changed, you changed the world entirely. You know, every, everything has changed. And, and that's true with the foods too. And so, you know, I mean, I think that, I think that the, the great foods from this part of the world are much like the great wines from this part of the world and really anywhere in the world, they come from ingredients. You know, they come from good ingredients and um, you, you, still, you still do. You talk about the truffles, um, the culture of pasta there and, and the culture of, uh, I saw that you, you, know, you had the, the gnocchi up, um, you know, those, those sorts of foods that are um, you know, meant to, meant to really highlight seasonal cuisine and the vegetables of a particular season, um, you know, with fresh and very clean and, and vibrant sort of flavors. Um, that's, that's what it's all about. I agree. All right. Anything else you want to add, Michael, before we let you go and get back to your busy life in Northern Virginia? Uh, no, I, I, I would just say once again, I, I can't tell you guys how much I appreciate this. It really is, uh, it's a treat to be able to participate. And, um, you know, I know that every, everybody is in a sort of strange and unsettling world right now. And um, for us in particular, you know, 60% 60, 60 of our business was probably restaurants. And, um, and so it's a, little bit, it's a little bit creepy right now. And so every bottle counts. I really, I, I, I can't thank you guys all enough for participating and, and supporting what we're doing and supporting 
you know, what you guys are doing at Fifth and Vine and it, it means the world. All right. Well, I think we always end this with a cheers. So sorry. Oh, there you got oh, one. Got it's not the 15. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, you, you guys have to remember I'm, I'm two hours ahead. <laughs> and you're still pretty sober. Nice job. It's definitely wine o'clock. So. <laughs> All, right. All right. So tomorrow we have uh, Gloria Gilbert from Gilbert Sellers. We did uh, Charlie Gilbert, I think last week or week before. I don't remember what with his red blend. What we're doing, and you guys are going to have to just live through this. It's a Riesling, so just relax. It's not sweet. It's got zero residual sugar. So sweet means in the wine world that it's got sugar still left in it, and this one has none. And I think you, uh, Nada actually does, doesn't, don't they do a Riesling? Yeah, he, he does, which is, which is fairly atypical. Um, but, you know, he, he, he thinks it's one of the best varietals on the planet, and so he wanted to have a little parcel of it and see what he could do. It's hard to sell in America because everybody sees the word Riesling and they think, oh, super sweet, and I don't want it, and blah, blah, blah. So tomorrow we're going to do that, and we've got um, Charlie's wife and also Boss, and he admitted that last week or whenever he was on <laughs> he's like my wife is my boss I'm like wow that's got to be interesting <laughs> um and we're drinking a riesling so i know uh, we got lots of weird things going on tomorrow so everybody that's kind of what we're going to do for food and i'm just going to go with the german thing i'm i'm doing the big bratwurst and sauerkraut and um even a little mustard spicy mustard and i think when i went to the saint helena school of uh wine pairing a few years back they said you can do two things or three things but one of the things is you kind of match wine to the region you're from or you you match the spiciness with spiciness or you wipe it clean so tomorrow night we're going to take the big bite of the bratwurst and the sauerkraut and the mustard and then we'll wipe it clean with that beautiful uh, riesling um, afterwards but you guys the more classic pairing would be like a light you know sole dober sole or something with a lemon butter garlic sauce but um you guys do what you want i'm not in charge it's coronavirus and you're all on your own i also i also always tell people that if you like if if you have any any warmth in your heart for spicy foods the the contrast if you're not trying to necessarily compliment but the contrast between spice and riesling is just it's my favorite food to have with uh with anything that's got some heat or my favorite wine for anything with heat yeah, I agree with that. I did it one time where I wouldn't let anybody see what I put in brown bags and I made a very spicy Thai dish and then they all said how much they hate sweet wines and <laughs> we wouldn't have, I wouldn't let them have any taste of the wine until we were done sampling or, you know, taking our first fruit bites and I poured it and they all loved it. And then by the time they got to the end of the meal, it's like, this was sweet. I'm like, I know you guys you don't just say you hate sweet wine. Like it's like only liking Merlot or something, you know, like just branch out. So don't anybody not drink, <laughs> well, sorry, not drink Riesling tomorrow. Just try it and with some fun food and, and plus, you know, we're all stuck at home anyway. So what the hell? Anyway, thank you, Michael, so much. It was, you were a pleasure and you're very informative and we can't wait to do another one of these with you if we get stuck. I would love to do a champagne tasting. It might be a little bit more expensive that than be fun. these, but <laughs> I would we, love to do that. We, 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 could also do, we could also do sparkling wine that's not champagne. You, oh, you guys yeah. have quite a bit. We got a couple fun ones. Yeah. Nice. But uh, consider me on call. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow. Thank 6 30. you. Cheers. 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 Okay. You're a stinker and you stink too. That was super fun, guys. Are we having a little after party here or something? Give me a second. Yeah, thanks. That was fun. I he's so informative. Yeah, no, that was that was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, good. I don't know um, that Barolo Boys. We watched Mark and I watched that, and it was great. I just don't know where to find it. Tara, maybe you're better at that than I am. Okay. I'll look for it. Okay. I think it was on Netflix, but I'm not, I just can't remember. He does cross it. Mm -hmm. our favorite. Thank you guys. Yeah. 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 Good to see you guys. 
I'll see you. I got burgers to cook. Nice. <laughs> Sounds good. Mark's Bye. making gnocchi. Making you gnocchi? He is. Now I really hate you both. I know. <laughs> you went to a champagne tasting without me, and you're having the gnocchi he teases with all day. The next trip is yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I know. Bye. Right, bye. Hi, Mark and Dave. <laughs> Hi, Brian and Malia. <laughs> Hi. Okay, I'm going to end the call. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, later. Bye. Bye. Bye.